Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, welcome to this, I don't know, is this the first webinar in Forces? I don't know, probably. <laughs> um, so the idea was to entertain you a little and um, then uh, when I was asked by Matt uh, what title I should give, I was quite audacious and uh, uh, thought I'd discuss uh, something ambitious which fits well into the pre-Christmas times where we have some freedom to say what we want. And I try to mix it with some science uh, and lessons from Arocom. And um, I want to start with the acknowledgement because I always forget it in the end. Uh, so I want to use the opportunity to thank really the steering committee of the Aerocom model intercomparison group uh, with Stefan Kinne from Hamburg and Mian Chin from Goddard who were very uh, patient and uh, discussed very nicely over the years. And Gunnar Björn Kostas Duncan joined recently. Uh, and I think uh, it has been a very fruitful cooperation over the years. But then we also have this backbone at, uh, at uh, Aerocom, which uh, works on the data, compiles them, works them up, uh, keeps track of the database, mixing files and reloading files with Jan, Jonas, Anna, Augusta, and in, uh, in France, it was Christiane Textor, which did a lot, and Sarah Giver actually also. And then uh, since I will talk about aerosol models, I, I, I got a lot of knowledge from modeling actually back in Hamburg uh, with the TM modeling and ECA modeling. And then we developed the Inca model together with Eve and Didier in, uh, at the LSCE in France, uh, which went into the IPSL climate model. And recently now uh, working with my colleagues at Metno AMAP and Norris M, I think that is always a source of inspiration for Aerocom that you know the models a bit better. And uh, of course, uh, I would show a lot of results from Aerocom and the ACAMIP modeling teams. I think uh, they have been over the years and also in the last year, last two years, very active and very uh, engaged to get up the best results uh, on the server, on the ESGF and the Aerocom server and which have been worked up. But then we also have these EU projects and actually maybe not everybody knows, but Aerocom really was a spring off of the Phoenix project, which uh, Maria at the time um, coordinated and she's still around like me <laughs> in the forces project. And uh, not to forget also you, Kari and Crescendo, who in the middle were important projects to develop aerosol models. And we have, uh, it couldn't be done without the institutional support uh, from the LSCE in France and Metno now in Norway for the last 10 years. Okay, so what do I mean by this idea, should we recode aerosol modules in ESM? Um, should each group recode aerosols individually? Should we replace parts of the aerosol code with better pieces? Should we have a community benchmark, an aerosol module which fits into several models or can be tested in several models? Where does the aerosol module end? Um, I mean, you might want to, you might need to couple it with chemistry, with the cloud uh, processes, with deposition, which is depending on uh, uh, surface properties, vegetation, emissions. We have, we had <laughs> discussions in the past on whether dust emissions do not fit into an aerosol module, but rather fit into the vegetation model. Radiation is another part in the climate model, which is not really an aerosol original uh, code. So where does this work end? And uh, what about uh, CTMs, box models? Uh, how do they fit to this? Who is we? That was a uh, last question I had on this page. Um, so a lot of questions and I, I'm sure we can discuss this forever, but I have some ideas and uh, maybe it's good to think about it in these times. So what is the problem? Um, I think that um, we still have 
a large uncertainty in aerosol forcing. Even though we have made great efforts to uh, harmonize, to intercompare, to, to bound the effort, uh, think of uh, Nicola Belouin's uh, and co-workers paper this year, uh, we have a cooling or warming contribution in the near future from the aerosol. If the aerosol loads uh, become much smaller, we will have some positive forcing from the aerosol trends. We will have additional warming by getting rid of the aerosol. So knowing that would be quite substantial in understanding near-term future. And then, of course, often these models are also used to um, simulate air quality. So very, quite a lot of these models are used for both, for forcing and for air quality simulations. So uh, having that right is uh, putting different uh, requests, requirements on the models and uh, different challenges. So I will show some, uh, some problems, uh, diversity in aerosol life cycle and optics. And the reasons are of course that there is uh, not like for CO2, a concentration and a dispersion and exchange with the biosphere, but there is some complex physics and chemistry involved, uh, which make the aerosol variable in composition and size. There's a mixing state to respect this. Uh, chemistry which interferes with the formation and the removal and the uh, change and dynamics of the aerosol. And then there's a the host model, the climate model, the ESM, which provides uh, temperature, uh, water, vapor, humidity, uh, transport, uh, mixing, convection, removal properties, which, which are not really uh, uh, the aerosol physics themselves, but which can uh, prevent us from understanding what is going wrong in an earth system model. So then on the technical side, I think the problem is that a lot of our codes are quite rigid because they have been uh, uh, put into a earth system model. Uh, it's often quite difficult to change parameterizations, to change um, the parameters. Uh, we don't have uh, easy diagnostics to verify some of the processes. Some of the diagnostics are bulk properties like optical depths. Uh, it is really not uh, pointing to the composition behind if you just evaluate aerosol optical depths. Uh, same with uh, number concentration, cloud CCMs. And then we have not enough resources to uh, CPU resources to treat uh, an indefinite number of tracers. Um, and that all leads to unknown errors, inconsistency in the current codes. Uh, and then there's the smooths, the groups are small. We have maybe in each ESM, we have uh, two to five people who really know the aerosol code. So they, they have to deal with all the problems and the questions. And uh, we have other deliveries than just checking every error. Um, and uh, then in result, I think we, we are not doing our best to transfer knowledge from, from model to model on the code side. We are diagnosing differences. Uh, we know quite well, maybe uh, bias, well, at least better than what is behind. And uh, in essence, we are not really coming up with recommendations of what to do better. I think that is probably a bit pessimistic altogether, but uh, it is an attempt to, to put the background to that. So why are aerosols crucial? So we, I put, took this figure actually, it's a temperature um, workup from CIMA 3, 5, 6, and the observations from the head crew at least sent a uh, climate record of temperature. And uh, it was worked up here by, by the ism Bal tool and Bock et al published this year. And you see the CMAP6 um, ensemble is a bit lower than uh, CMAP5 and CMAP3 for this temperature uh, re um, record. 
you see it is uh, constantly below uh, the ensemble envelope is constantly below the other envelopes uh, after 1960. So it is a sign, it is a, it is a hint that uh, the aerosol forcing has really changed uh, in these ensembles. Unfortunately, uh, there's no very good understanding of the forcing and the older ensembles, the aerosol forcing. So it is difficult to um, trace back the reason for this uh, differences in the ensembles, but it's, it's probably uh, a good, we, we have good reason to believe that the aerosol forcing is a bit more negative in the, in the recent CMIP-6 ensemble. And that is of course um, a good reason to understand. Uh, if you look at the ensemble mean, it's not so far from the temperature record, but uh, there were papers out uh, by colleagues who pretend, who say that uh, uh, probably some of the 60s to 90s aerosol forcing was too large in, in some models. And it would be of course nice to uh, put this together in a more consistent way and understand the real forcing. If you plot just the forcing history, upper left panel, which uh, Chris Smith has now put together from the different uh, CMIP-6 models, uh, you get to this uh, value of minus one watt per square meter in the 2000 uh, years for the ensemble. You get still a large scatter. Uh, some models have uh, aerosol forcing going down to minus two watt per square meter. The dark black line is, um, is the estimate from the reanalysis, uh, which uh, Beluin et al. have put together. Uh, you see that it's a rather flat uh, forcing curve. From that estimate, some of the models show uh, already a decrease in forcing, a more less negative forcing in the latest uh, two decades. Um, this is also in Gunnar's uh, workup of the AOD trends in the models in the historical AeroCom simulations. You see some models uh, still have an increase in AOD in the last two decades some flatten off. In Europe and North America for sulfate, I think we, we understand the trend pretty well. We, we get to what the emissions, the emissions and the observations and what the models make out of it, they correlate very well. The small differences in Europe and North America, Europe with a steeper gradient, North America with a flatter gradient in the early 90s. Uh, and then uh, maybe another paper to to remember here from our group, Keenes work up uh, what Trude started uh, to compare the model ensemble um, from CMAP6 here to the surface radiation and uh, on, the, on a global scale compared to Geber, it looks like the models don't have enough uh, absorption extinction in the atmosphere. So this is a sign that we have not enough aerosol in the, in the in the atmosphere, maybe um, dominated by Asian uh, misunderstanding or Asian data. So this is uh, just uh, one piece of the puzzle that we don't understand uh, the aerosol forcing perfectly. So the recent trends, uh, we have this paper out now from my colleague, Augustin, very nice workup of different observations of optical properties. Um, and uh, you see also here the reanalysis from ECMWF. The observations are different networks. Um, this is just Europe. So AOD, of course, is uh, Aeronet. You find quite a trend in this period, 2000 to 2014 in Europe of minus 3% uh, per year. So there's a lot of uh, aerosol trend actually uh, visible on average. And the models kind of pick this up, maybe have a little too small trend. Uh, uh, there is similar variability in uh, AROCOM and CMIP-6 model uh, ensemble. And uh, the fine mode is probably better captured. The fine mode trends are probably better captured than coarse mode trends. And that's maybe not so surprising because this would reflect also natural variations of sea salt and dust. There's little trend in the Angstrom exponent, both observed and modeled and PM2.5 uh, is 
kind of confirming that uh, we have this negative trends in the anthropogenic and fine mode AOD. Also about 2.6% in both observations and, and the models where we had this. PM10 would then uh, correspond to the coarse mode AOD and you see more variability and smaller trends for PM10. And sulfate, uh, which is the sulfate we used for this OS et al paper also, is actually more negative in the Aerocon ensemble. So there might be some uh, large trend still in the emissions, which is not uh, uh, really in the record of the observations. And for the surface scattering and absorption, we have unfortunately not so many models in this uh, trend work. So that would be nice to, to work up with more data. But you see also here the scattering, the surface scattering also had a 2.5, uh, 2.4 percent per year scattering in that period. So that fits nicely to our understanding of AOD and fine mode uh, PM2.5. If you do that for the CMIP6 models uh, for the same period um, and for different regions for the Aeronet just, uh, you see that the models, the uh, CMIP6 models, they have quite some scatter. So for Asia, the observations maybe show a small trend. Maybe the period is not the best for this, establishing these trends because you have a change in emissions maybe after 2005. Uh, so having a trend in that period is, is not really a stable uh, exercise. Uh, but you also have quite a different uh, uh, trends in the different models, although they all use the same anthropogenic seeds emissions. So. Um, uh, we are still wondering why the models have different trends. We, we are investigate whether dust and sea salt variations uh, in the different models impact these trends. But uh, ideally we, we, we have a better understanding of that. And uh, I think it's crucial to, to, to know, to have a better understanding also of this latest period because that is that we could maybe extrapolate uh, better to the near future. But back to the diversity of the model. I, I'm uh, picking some results uh, which really are available now because of the Aricom modelers and uh, Jonas who put this together in the last year. This is the revised version. Unfortunately, ACP has managed to, um, to make it available in its final version. They are a bit slow these days. Maybe they have too many papers to uh, process and uh, make publication ready, but if you want to, to have it, uh, we can just send it to you. So the idea was here to, to concentrate on the optical properties, evaluate them, but also uh, have at the same time, the lifetime, the life cycle of the aer aerosols uh, diagnosed and put together in one table for the models. And you have here quite a range of models again. And in this table, you also find uh, the old results from, uh, Texto et al. from 2007. And I go to some results of this uh, table uh, to illustrate what we can learn from that. So if you just look into the life cycle, so going from emissions uh, with a certain lifetime to burden, um, you have here the variability summarized in that column for this Aerocom phase three and Aerocom phase one on the very right side. And the first thing to maybe very grossly uh, take from this table is that this variability, the standard deviation of the model results didn't really decrease. So I think that's um, a bit disappointing, um, maybe difficult to achieve, but uh, it is clearly a sign that uh, the models have not converged or do the same thing. They still have their own flavor and uh, own idea of how to model the aerosol. Uh, we could pick some results um, like um, nitrate, which was recently introduced in the, in the models, the, even the formation of nitrate has a large variability. Uh, for black carbon, you see that the emissions are pretty much the same. That's not no surprise because that's really almost uh, directly taken from the seeds emissions. 
so it reflects that they use the same emissions. Uh, while for dust and sea salt, you have uh, natural uh, emissions, and then they differ quite a bit uh, because the model themselves uh, create these emissions. So this is 150% variability for sea salt and 60% uh, for dust. A bit less variability for dust, uh, maybe because more work was going into dust uh, models than into checking the sea salt. And for the organic aerosols, you actually find also quite a variability depending on if you use interquartile range or standard deviation. And probably this organic aerosol formation is also quite variable in the model because they have secondary organic aerosol formation. They have uh, anthropogenic aerosol formation. They, they don't agree really on, on how this organic aerosol formation is, is, is really uh, done. And it is hard to, to diagnose really what is the reason for this diversity for the organic aerosols in case you're interested. Um, Sulfate is still uh, quite variable. And I think one of the reasons is that there's also some DMS hidden in this. This is not the anthropogenic uh, life cycle. This is really the life cycle for the year 2010. So we have some uh, anthropogenic and volcanic and DMS derived sulfate going into the life cycle of sulfate. Uh, but that was also the case in 2007. So it doesn't, there's no reason to, to have this variability lifetime. I'm getting to that in a moment. And that of course leads to burden. Um, not everything became less or worse or more diverse. For instance, the lifetime of black carbon went down from 6.5 to 5.5 days from aerocom phase one to aerocom phase three. And I think that's because there was some really striking aircraft measurements in the upper troposphere saying, saying that there was very little black carbon reaching the upper troposphere. Uh, and uh, this paper from um, some said summarized a bit these different profiles uh, measured. And he could show with, with the colleagues that uh, the lifetime of black carbon actually became very long uh, in some models because the black carbon was uh, put through convection and uh, limited washout to the upper troposphere, upper layers of the troposphere. And uh, that actually created quite an error against the aircraft profiles. And if you plot this error in different ways, the RMS or bias or normalized mean bias against this uh, lifetime, you could see that the models which are with a shorter lifetime actually had uh, quite a different profile. And, uh, and uh, that suggested that the, the lifetime of black carbon was really too long. A different way of showing that uh, we have too much uh, black carbon in the upper troposphere. And that uh, probably created some convergence for the black carbon um, lifetime and life cycle. But, uh, Lifetime is, is, of course, a factor which only indirectly influences uh, the forcing in the end, because uh, we start with emissions and uh, the lifetime then uh, multiplied with the emissions gets us to burden and finally to the, aircom, the optical properties and there is loads which then translate into forcing. Uh, but it's interesting to, to look at the, the difference between the models. If you look, for instance, here for EC Earth and TM5, these lifetimes are pretty similar. Also for the two ECAM versions, you see some similarities. Um, that is probably because the host models and the way they are implemented are similar in those two versions. So there's some simple correlation because of the sim similar structure in the models and the interaction with the aerosol part. Um, then you have a model like ECMWS, which has quite short lifetime. Um, this is not the analysis. This is the free running uh, IFS model, which was used in this study. And uh, it is, has the shortest lifetime in, in all the, all, from all the other models. Maybe Sprinters has also some very short lifetimes. Uh, and we know that uh, the assimilation of um, 
the difference between the assimilation run and the control run uh, always uh, creates a bias. Uh, assimilation, the assimilated IFS model also has higher loads, higher aerosol loads, and this aerosol is lost within the first days after assimilation, and it's then approaching this uh, control simulation. So there's probably some uh, hint that uh, the removal is too large in the IFS model. If you look into the differences between the species, uh, we find that uh, nitrate is still probably not well understood, uh, also for the lifetime, a uh, lot of variation. Uh, between the models, not all models have nitrate. Sea salt, similarly, maybe there for another reason. Maybe we have really a size distribution issue for the south for sea salt. And uh, smallest uh, variation actually for the organic aerosol. Once it's formed, uh, it seems that the models are treating it quite similarly. Uh, of course, we, we don't know if this is the true uncertainty in all this. Um, we, we don't know if we really captured all diagnostic errors. Do we really understand all deposition and all emission terms here uh, from the output of the models, um, which is sometimes hidden in the code. And uh, since we don't look at the code, but maybe have some questionnaires or tables in the paper, uh, we, we might still miss something hidden behind here. And uh, in the end, we, we have to we have to consider we have to confess that we do not have a very clear explanation across the models why uh, the lifetimes change. Um, so uh, we have to get on. I think it's a it's a it's a great uh, reference now, but uh, we have to probably work a bit more to understand what is really the difference here and what to do out of it. For the optical properties, we find similarly that uh, phase one and phase three, actually I missed here. So the, this one is of course phase three. This is phase one. Uh, also here, the optical, the diversity between the models didn't really go down. Um, we also found some inconsistencies which point to that the code is, is not always uh, uh, consistent. Uh, so for instance, we had more absorption than extinction in four models uh, for black carbon. We can argue about that black carbon optical depth is probably not an easy uh, quality, not, not an easy property to diagnose because you have to split the AOD in mixed aerosols between different species according to volume. And that's probably a different way than uh, computing absorption from uh, just the amount of uh, black carbon and uh, some assumption on uh, absorption enhancement or absorption mass extinction. But it's, it's, a, it's maybe a sign of that uh, not all the codes are really optimal and consistent in, its, in themselves. And uh, it's sometimes hard to detect uh, um, without review and, and inspection. What else here? So I think uh, this figure is also in this paper is, is interesting because it shows uh, how we get from the diversity in emission to burden to optical depths. For black carbon, we just saw that the emissions are very similar, but then uh, there's quite some difference still in the lifetime. And that uh, gray area here is the interquartile range in this figure. And since we start with pretty similar emissions, the deviation of the models from the median is uh, uh, in the burden is quite correlated to the, to the lifetime. But for other properties like dust here, you see that uh, these lines cross over. So not always uh, is a model with a lot of emissions uh, creating a, a lot of uh, burden because they um, have a low lifetime. And then uh, this uh, can be interpreted in uh, uncertainties in, in the individual processes. For organic aerosols here, you see that uh, um, 
the mass extinction coefficient and actually the lifetime are pretty uh, uh, small, the variability, but then the emissions are already pretty uh, variable and that creates then also the burden variability and finally AOD variability. For sea salt, you see that the lifetime is, uh, lifetime divergence is much larger than um, the mass extinction. So there's a sign here that uh, we have very different coarse and fine fractions of sea salt in the models. And nitrate is, as we have discussed, as I've discussed before, uh, clearly a, a part of the, of the models, which is very diverse. Um, so if we compare to observations, um, the, the goal here was really, and Jonas uh, worked hard on this, uh, is to, to use different data sets um, and combine them all in one paper so that we have a better overview. So we have here the angstrom exponent, which is the uh, wavelength dependency of AOD and indicates the size uh, of the aerosol, at least, or, optical interpretation of size. We have different uh, Aeronet, uh, different AOD data sets from Aeronet, from the stations and from uh, satellites. Um, we have the CCI products, uh, the MODIS products, and we have the MERGE products, uh, which FMI put together. So they are all a bit similar, uh, but they are different. Uh, have different coverage. AOD from Aeronet is of course only at stations and the rest one are uh, satellite products which have larger coverage. We then have coarse AOD and fine AOD and scattering at the surface and absorption at the surface. And um, the, what you take from here is really um, first of all that there's a lot of blue. So we have um, a lot of uh, underestimate of AOD against both satellite and Aeronet, but also against the surface scattering. We have some underestimate also against fine mode uh, AOD. We have a bit more scatter on coarse AOD, but uh, that also in the end, in the ensemble for the ensemble model has uh, an underestimate. Uh, it is not, um, we, we find some hints also in the correlation table here below that uh, the ocean AOD, ocean aerosol in ECAM, in both versions of ECAM and in Norris M are, are not, uh, have not the right uh, variation over the year in the regions. So we know for Norris M we have a bit too much uh, sea salt or maybe a, a, a sea salt distribution, which is not absolutely correct. So that is clearly reflected in this figure. We also find, I, I kind of uh, marked here the, the winner on all these categories for regression, which is a very poor way of uh, maybe indicating the, the best model, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a first attempt uh, to see what could be a reference. And for many of these uh, comparisons, the Aerocom median model constructed from all these models is, is still the best reference, something we have, uh, stated for many years in, in the Aerocom um, community. Uh, but there are also some, uh, some sometimes uh, other models which, pre which appear to be pretty nice. Uh, so the GEOS, the GOKART model from uh, the group in Goddard uh, sticks out. And I think also the TM5 and Easy Earth uh, are a very nice uh, model in this, uh, in this uh, comparison and the IFS model and uh, has funny enough, uh, very the best uh, correlation to absorption at the bottom. Also the AMAP model actually seems to, to get to the surface concentrations pretty nicely. So there's some, uh, some uh, message here for the other models that uh, is maybe interesting to understand uh, and uh, which is one of the motivation to work together here also. So should we recode the aerosol modules in ESMs? And I picked two standpoints here. So first is the negative one, no way. <laughs> so if you start to, to get that question or if you raise that question, you get answers like, good luck. I'm quite skeptic that will ever work. And uh, 
there's already a lot of wisdom in the models. That's true. Um, they do their job. They compute aerosol ERF. They have a lot of species. They have a lot of diagnostics. Um, the ensemble is probably giving us some reasonable estimate of the of the aerosol properties. Um, and you could be even hearing statements like, uh, well, in some years, it's all overtaken by greenhouse gas forcing anyway, if uh, mankind is continuing like it is. So why invest into even more aerosol work here? Um, or like statements like uh, aerosol takes too much space in climate assignment science, it's the clouds, stupid. <laughs> um, there are, I mean, you could argue that maybe single bright scientists are more effective than crowds, uh, which have difficulties to communicate. Uh, you might find your model best. Um, should it be done jointly? Or isn't it too complicated to co coordinate? This great guy from Finland didn't succeed neither. We don't know what to do. We have no funding for it. And all these reasons can be raised. Uh, you can imagine that I'm not so pessimistic, but still, I think there are valid points here. And I am quite interested to, to hear what you all think. Um, one reason to think about redoing models is also that they take still a lot of CPU. And uh, I just... Uh, try to figure out in the Norris M2 how much uh, CPU time it takes. Uh, so if you do just a aerosol only um, model, you, you can get to 20 years simulated uh, in uh, per a real day. So it takes some days before you do a historical simulations. Uh, we don't know exactly how much the aerosol code really takes of CPU. And uh, one of the reasons is that uh, it's so deep in the code that uh, we cannot really, we cannot easily uh, switch it off. And um, I, we estimate it's 20% of the atmospheric model time. If you then go to the Earth system model, you couple to the ocean, the whole model gets 30% slower. If you add the more complete AeroCom diagnostics, you still need a bit more time, 5% more CPU time, which is quite a bit, but uh, not as much as for the other problems. High frequency output, if you want to study uh, not only monthly output, but hourly and daily output, it quickly gets also slower, the model. If you increase the resolution from two to one degree, it's getting a factor three almost slower. If you do it just for the atmosphere, then uh, you're even more penalized because this is the atmosphere uh, change only. The, the ocean resolution doesn't change in these comparisons here. So the atmosphere is uh, quite expensive if you increase resolution. And part of it is the aerosol. Uh, we, we know that the CSM2 runs quicker than Norris M2. Uh, actually, it's both the aerosol and the ocean, which are here culprits. And we don't know exactly what part is uh, the difference, uh, what, what is really the reason here for that the Norris M2 is slower. But probably the aerosol is part of it. and. Uh, that's a motivation to also rework code, I think. So the positive side, um, should we do that? Should we engage in uh, recoding aerosol models? Uh, I think it can be fun. <laughs> um, I think uh, we still believe, uh, I still believe that uh, both for aerosol forcing and air quality, it is worth the effort uh, to improve the modules and uh, to get a better understanding. Um, there is uh, still one watt per square meter aerosol forcing, two watt per square meter CO2 forcing. So I think there's good reasons uh, to, to invest in the model and the aerosol modules. Uh, the, we, it is one part of the earth system model and uh, we should do our best to, to improve that part. And then I think what is also now changing is that 
more and more of the aerosol codes actually get available. So we have a starting point. We can uh, in inspect the different uh, aerosol codes. We can learn from each other, probably much different than 10 years, 20 years ago. Uh, GitHub, shared computing hubs become operational. Um, and there is some machine learning in, in several models, which is called tabulation. But I think the modern methods have not been used uh, extensively to improve the uh, Earth system model. So that's also a, a nice uh, nice uh, opportunity maybe to, to improve the, the aerosol part and maybe the link to the clouds. Uh, so in the end, that should give us more reliable results and, and allow for other great science if we also invest in the methodology and the instrument we are using, uh, I think also instruments get better and get renew, renew, renewed or even exchanged after some time. Um, and then also, I think um, we still have some useless code, uh, which is not really affecting ERF. Uh, some, some of the simpler aerosol codes in this aerocom comparisons work as good as the more complicated ones. So it would be nice to find out what part is really crucial. Um, we will use less CPU. Um, and I think also by jointly recoding aerosol models, I think the code itself becomes reviewed and not, di not just the diagnostics. So far, we are really looking at the output and, and uh, have not really checked uh, the humidity growth formulation in one model and against the other one. So there's a, there's a low hanging fruit, maybe just to compare the different parts of the aerosol code and understand what they really do. Um, so I just tried to compile uh, some links to codes which are available and uh, yeah, maybe half of them are really available. If you ask, uh, uh, even more available. Uh, some few aerosol codes are probably uh, behind some firewalls. Um, but I think there's enough to, 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 to restart. Uh, the list is incomplete and uh, I'm interested to, to learn more from you. Um, at the Aerocom conference and workshop, uh, there was the idea that actually one should start with a box model. And there are some box models existing. Uh, I listed them here, um, not out of reach for the forces consortium, for instance. Um, and uh, the challenge is that the box model might be far away from the earth system model. So that should be a criterion for investing in a, a box model that in the end, you can also plug it into an earth system model. Uh, you will not validate it so easily with uh, ambient observations because it's an idealized simulation, but then it's simple. You can play more easily. It's a test bed. So there was some interest in the Aerocom workshop to, to maybe uh, put some efforts together. And uh, if I would start from the start from scratch, uh, I think it must be something uh, like a, a community model, uh, maybe an Aerocom as a module. We, we need to, to look into available code. We shouldn't start everything from scratch, but we have to probably agree on some structure for the aerosol traces so that we can test for size composition mixing assumptions. And uh, some of the code has to be really independent and uh, we, have to, we have to be critical about what really needs to be so deep into an earth system model and what can be done maybe outside of, uh, of the earth system model uh, tested in a box model. Um, and uh, machine learning I mentioned already. And of course, uh, we, we have to put more emphasis on aerosol cloud interaction. I think the community has spent a lot of time also on, um, on uh, the direct effect. And maybe we, we really need to put emphasis on how we couple to the aerosol clouds, to the clouds um, and uh, how to find the parameters which, which are really crucial there. Um, and of course, then we, we have to have some test cases, uh, benchmarks, uh, and maybe in some models, this can be tested, I think in CAM, ECAM, and uh, there are already uh, different solutions uh, available. So that, that could be a start. 
we have in, in, in the CAM model, we have the, the NCAR solution and the OSCO solution. There's also the easy aerosol now in. And uh, that is a way to go. And then uh, there was another idea from, from the Aerocon workshop, actually. Uh, <laughs> credit goes here to Eve. Um, that maybe we need some um, some table with uh, useful global aerosol properties which the models have to respect. And uh, there was a table already in in Nicolas uh, and co-workers uh, uh, review on aerosol forcing, uh, which actually shows a lower and an upper bound for different aerosol uh, forcing related properties, and. Uh, that should be uh, that could be expanded, I think, for other properties of of the aerosol and for observed quantities, and uh, it uh, would give some uh, some hint to the model as what they should uh, work out over a simulation uh, that could be revised every year. Uh, a commission would need to be constituted from observational and modeling experts. There were quite some people who volunteered to, to work on that. So uh, that's an idea to, to approach the recoding results with something uh, from the observational side. So that's, I think, very positive. And I think also this, uh, the work uh, at uh, University of Leeds is, is uh, interesting in, in many senses. And I picked here this result from this year's publication, which uh, plotted the uh, yeah, the range of uh, uh, constraint uh, parameter choices against what forcing uncertainty would result from, from that range. Um, and uh, they ranked then the, the different parameters in the aerosol model according to importance. And uh, yeah, so two emissions are of course uh, directly translating into forcing uncertainty, but also the updraft speed was uh, very important. Uh, parameter, which I think was also in forces uh, viewed as something we should work on. Um, DMS emissions actually appear also pretty high because they constitute the background natural aerosol on which uh, uh, indirect effect uh, works. And I must say that also in the Norris M, we were surprised uh, in the tuning period of CMIP6 that uh, DMS emissions were quite uh, influential on, on what we in the end uh, get to as forcing in the model and uh, nucleation. Yeah, you can read the list yourself. I thought the, the question here is, could this be tested in other models? Because this is now really uh, one model uh, which has tested all this. And uh, that's actually uh, pretty difficult. And that's one of the reasons also to maybe rethink our code because it, we should be able to, to test uh, a parameter range in, in different models. And I think uh, we haven't asked ourselves whether it's possible and haven't had taken the time to, to systematically vary uh, parameters in our code. So that would be one um, task or motivation to also um, work on, rework the code. So light on the horizon, uh, getting, close to the end. Um, I think uh, there's really a nice uh, community spirit in the Aerocom community. So that's a good start. Um, there was work, as I said, on uh, thinking about what are constraints. There's uh, the approach from Leeds to test uh, perturbed model examples. There was even experiments suggested to do that. Um, there's also initiatives in the US, uh, musical uh, development of a common community physics package uh, uh, with, uh, which was mentioned at the Aerocom workshop. And also in Japan, people started to, to think about uh, jointly developing uh, code, aerosol code. Uh, if you haven't heard about there's also an initiative from MIT and Caltech starting a climate model from scratch. Um, we have new tools, CMIP7 is hopefully in the far future. So we have a little time now to do something else. Uh, maybe it can uh, 
also lead to some better Earth system predictions if we improve uh, aerosol and cloud code, and that could lead to funding. And of course, we have uh, the force project, which is really essential here. And it's great that we have that at the moment. Uh, there are probably several positions open, but we also have a position open at the Norwegian Meteorological Institute. So in summary, I think, yes, uh, I'm always maybe too optimistic, but uh, it could be done. Um, I think we have reusable aerosol code. We have to define the aerosol structure. We should think about uh, how to start uh, with a box model, just picking some processes. Um, of course, the community approach always needs some uh, structure to get uh, them to the recognition of the contributors, but I think uh, that's not the biggest problem here. And uh, yeah, with that, I thank you for the attention. <laughs>